Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the Rice Easy Computer Engineering Distinguished Speaker webinar today. So before introducing our speaker, let me briefly go through some logistics. First, uh, if you have questions during the talk, you can message me in the Q&A chat uh, at the bottom of your window. And then at the end of the talk, we will select those questions to be answered by our speaker. Meanwhile, during the talk, I will monitor the Q&A chat uh, in case there are questions that are better to be addressed or clarified in the middle of the talk. Second, this talk will be recorded and uploaded to our department's YouTube channel uh, for future access. Um, next, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, distinguished speaker for our computer engineering seminar, Professor Hardy as a mayor of the day. Professor Azamea's Dave obtained his PhD from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UCSD, where he was awarded an uh, early tenure and is the first holder of the Holly Sear Guru Chair in Computer uh, Architecture with the rank of an associate professor. At UCSD, he is also the associate director of the Center of, for Machine uh, Integrated Computing and Security. Prior to uh, UCSD, he was an assistant professor at Georgia Tech until 2017, where he was the first holder of an early, uh, early career professorship. For research, he and his team have been developing new technologies and cross-stack solutions for the next generation computer systems. Um, he has received numerous awards and recognition, uh, notably including the following. A best dissertation award at his PhD alma mater at the University of Washington, uh, the Young Architect Award of IEEE Technical Committee on Computer Architecture, the Air Force Office's uh, Young Investigator Award, three Qualcomm Research Awards, three Google Research Faculty Awards, two Microsoft uh, Research Awards. And he was inducted into the ISCA Hall of Fame in 2018. Finally, uh, as a personal note, it was a nice surprise to find out that he's also a musician and plays Persian drums very well. So thank you very much, Hadi, for agreeing to spend this time with us. It's yours. Thank you very much, Celine. That was an elaborate, like, you know, introduction and I'm kind of mortified with all the, you know, all the commendations that you, uh, you gave me. It's a, quite a pleasure for me to be presenting uh, in this uh, lecture series and it's, a, you know, quite an honor for me to be talking to you guys about the, some of the research that we are doing. I have, I told Celine that I have over 200 you know, slides, and that doesn't even cover all the te technology that we have developed. So I'm just going to go over some of the, you know, the ideas, uh, you know, in, in the work uh, without necessarily getting into all of the details. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free to ask me questions during the talk. And uh, if you uh, require more details, we are happy to share the papers as necessary. So my, today I'm going to talk about how to use AI for, you know, accelerating the AI execution. Um, before I actually, you know, start uh, talking about the, you know, the work that we are doing, I have to acknowledge a humongous group of students who have done tirelessly to develop these technologies and they are the real reason that I am here and presenting these uh, different uh, the technologies. They are actually very much in touch with the industry and the, most of the technologies that we are developing is in relationship with industry collaborators and industry you know, funding as uh, Celine pointed out. Uh, 
before I actually dive into AI itself, this is a work that we haven't published yet, and I'm happy to talk to you guys about. Uh, you know, this work, it's a compilation stack for cross-domain, uh, you know, polymorphic acceleration. Uh, if we actually look at real-world applications, real-world applications are not deep learning. I'm very sorry to inform you that, like, you know, in a, in a sense, if you are looking at self-driving cars or, you know, or um, delivery drones, usually what you have is that you have to sense the environment and that requires a lot of digital signal processing, uh, you know, uh, workloads that is the subject of a lot of acceleration prior to the recent wave into the acceleration and, you know, VLIW. Uh, processors, uh, especially from Texas Instruments, are kind of a specialized hardware in that domain. Then you uh, you collect these sensory information, you pre-process them with the DSP algorithms, and then that is when you apply deep learning or data analytics to perceive the world and build a model based on which that you want to apply control theory to perform action. So, and I think. Uh, the community's just focus on deep learning is kind of negligent of this end-to-end application scenarios that we really need to go after. And this is why we, we have been trying to develop a compilation stack for uh, you know, multi-domain applications. In reality, what has happened is that for the last 40 or 50 years, we were developing one platform that is general purpose CPUs for every a you know, application that you can imagine. And we have been using that. With the, you know, with the failure of the Nordic scaling and the you know, looming uh, you know, ramifications of dark silicon, the community has done a complete swing into the, another world, which is we're gonna build one piece of hardware for every individual algorithm and even like, you know, uh, you know in a broader sense, domain specific architecture. What that means is that, uh, you know, we are leaving a lot of unexplored areas in the middle, uh, you know, uh, on the table. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at, as I, you know, presented like a minute ago, right, you look at real world applications, these real world applications are a collage of, you know, a few domains of, uh, you know, uh, algorithms. And we really need to uh, think about how we can provide a unified, uh, you know, environment that is not general purpose, but it is not also domain specific. And Polymath is an effort in that direction. And, uh, you know, we're ready to open source it and we are very happy to work with you guys to start using it. It's developed in a very modular, pass-based, uh, you know, LLVM-like, uh, you know, environment. And its target, uh, you know, domains is robotics, DSP, deep learning, and data analytics. So what we were trying to do with Polymass is that we wanted to start, and usually what I do when you know start a line of research, I start with designing languages, because languages are the most important aspect of a uh, you know a usable system. If we don't have high-level intuitive programming environment, it's extremely hard to utilize any architecture or hardware innovations that we are developing. And then when we are developing the languages, the general philosophy that my research group and my, you know, I follow is that I you know, put aside my hardware hat and I say, I'm not gonna do anything that exposes hardware or makes my hardware development easier. What I'm trying to do is to provide the highest level of you know, uh, languages uh, or abstractions in such a way that people who do not understand even code optimization be able to leverage you know, accelerators. And that is an ongoing challenge that we have been, uh, you know, uh, we have been uh, working. In this, you know, particular design of the language, we, we were kind of posed with a, an extra level of difficulty and challenge, which is supporting multiple, uh, you know, domains at the, at the same time and being able not to tie ourselves to the existing algorithms that like people are, uh, you know, accelerating and being able to extend the, you, you know, the algorithms and the applications that can be, uh, you know, implemented. Because of that, uh, you know, we have gone a mathematical route and then we have developed a, uh, you know, a, um, a cross-domain language. So this is not a DSL. It is a cross-domain language and I, I don't, 
even have a good acronym for it yet. So this is kind of like, you know, fresh out, uh, you know, out of the album that I'm presenting for you. That is one, uh, you know, one of the challenges that you want to capture multiple domains that have some sort of, com you know, a commonality. And here, the, the commonality that we are, uh, you know, going after is the mathematical expressions that are prevalent in these, uh, you know, four domains. The second part of it, which actually is pretty hard, and it's been a challenge we have been developing this infrastructure for the last two years. And Sean Kinzer, my student, has done a bang up job, like you know, just developing something that is robust, usable, and can target multiple domains. The second challenge is actually, uh, uh, you know, this compiler now needs to target multiple hardware. Usually when you are looking at domain specific, uh, you know, languages, they have been designed for a specific hardware target. There are certain recent, uh, recent efforts that, uh, you know, tries to create uh, like, you know, environments that can target multiple hardwares for deep learning like TVM, which, uh, you know, which admire very much, but still TVM falls short of, uh, you know, uh, enabling uh, accesses for multiple accelerators. Uh, that are not designed in-house. And beyond that is also the fact that is still TVM is, uh, uh, you know, is targeted uh, for deep learning mostly. And it's, uh, 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 you know, it's designed for, you know, expression of deep learning. Where we here, we are trying to use deep learning as a subset, not the focal point of the language. So, uh, the the you know the workflow that we are developing for uh, PM Lang and this is available now we can actually share it with you guys this is part of the RTML project that we kind of like you know uh, utilize this and it can actually now uh, support a variety of uh, domains and languages is that we have a polymath lang uh, po polymath language that starts from mathematics ex mathematical explorations the philosophy that guides uh, you know PM Lang is that you know when you are expressing any DSP or control algorithm or even deep learning, you're expressing mathematical operations. And it's bizarre that we take mathematical operations, although computer science and computer engineering has come out of mathematics department, and convert them to sequential programs. While if you look at a mathematical expression like sigma over xi wi, sigma itself is a parallel, uh, you know, operation. And then we, when we write it, we write it as a for loop in our, our you know, sequential programs. We're not insane that we are doing it. The reason being is that traditionally all the programming languages that have been developed, they have been developed for sequential hardware substrate. We had one CPU, and for the longest time, it was even single issue. Then we started like, you know, making a multiple issue to exploit ILP, but that was completely hidden from the, you know, the, the language. So here we don't want you to express any parallelism, any requirements about, uh, you know, vectorization. We just want you to write the formulation of the, pro, uh, you know, the algorithm that you want to implement. So that is the PM lang, uh, you know, um, side of the, the, the language design. The, but the, the heart of our compilation is that uh, is a, a, you know, a data flow graph representation that is not conventional data flow graph. We call it multi-granular data flow graph. And I would like to think about it as a fractalized view of a data flow graph. The reason, and let me explain, explain what, what I mean by a multi-granular data flow graph. You can think about it as a recursive uh, you know, uh, representation, uh, intermediate representation. Each node of the, uh, you know, a multi-granular data flow graph is a multi-granular data flow graph. As you zoom into each of these nodes, you can see again another hierarchical representation of the program. And then until you reach to the scalar operations. Why are we doing this? Like this, Data flow, uh, multi granular data flow graph allows you, enables you to access any level of granularity in terms of the representation of the program at the same time. So you get simultaneous access to any, le any level of granularity. Why is this important? This is important because I actually don't know when I'm compiling through polymath what kind of accelerator I'm going to be targeting. 
it's not an in-house accelerator that I have designed. The objective is that I want to actually support multiple domains of acceleration, and each domain is going to offload a different granularity of the operations to the, uh, you know, to the accelerator. But when, but and I don't know what that is, right? So I keep all the granularity that is available in the program structure in my intermediate representation so that any accelerator can. You know, when I say any, it's a little bit, uh, you know, too, uh, too broad, but a vast majority of the accelerator could be utilized. But that is the granularity of offloading. After you, after you have decided that I want to, for example, uh, you know, offload a convolution operation into an you know accelerator. Now you have to schedule the operations in a very fine uh, you know fine fine grain manner. Although knowing that you have a convolution operation is going to help you to optimize the data movements, the operations as well. So we keep that this is a convolution. We also give you those fine grain operations that you can uh, you know on top of your accelerator to uh, you know schedule them. So uh, that is the secret sauce that we are. Uh, you know, developing. And uh, the language that we have designed for each of the, the modules that you, you have, you have uh, some input data which is coming inside the, you know, inside the, the, uh, the, the function or the component that you, you are performing data processing. There is output that is, uh, you know, that is clear. And then you have to remember when you are doing, for example, a convolution operation, and I'm saying convolution operation because that is the most uh, you know, common thing that comes to mind and it's easy to think about uh, given the, the interest in deep learning, right? You have some persistent state. For example, weights of the convolution are neither input nor output. They're persistent state. The same goes if you are doing a trajectory planning uh, you know, the parameters here that you are seeing, these are persistent states that you can, uh, you know, you, you need to, uh, to, to keep. And these persistent states get mapped into the internal, you know, memory of the, you know, accelerator. I'm playing a trick here by, uh, you know, segregating input, output, and persistent state, because having these type modifiers, we call them like in type mod modifiers in the PL language, allows you to better allocate them in the memory, right? So if you know certain values are the weight parameters, you know where, where you need to do, you know, put it if you are doing a systolic array or if you want to do a data flow acceleration. So we're giving you that information as meta, you know, information in the, uh, you know, in the MGDFG that we have, uh, we, we have developed. If you look at the program that we are, uh, you know, we are developing for this, you see we don't even have four groups. They are unnecessary when it comes to mathematics. Nobody writes for loops. But you have iterators, indices, that iterate over the data with different, uh, you know, strides and things like that. And you can see that here, like, you know, what we are predicting, we are predicting the next state of the robot, and that is a sum over i, some, uh, you know, uh, previous state that you had, some position that you are, or, you know, you, you add the prediction K with the sum of some other, you know, parameters that you are doing. This is literally translation. If, if you know LaTeX, it's very similar to writing mathematics. And, uh, you know, LaTeX, it's a little bit like, you know, easier to write, uh, you know, uh, what you are doing here. And I'm going to show you some user study uh, points. As I, uh, you know, as I pointed out for you guys, this program gets actually translated to a multi-granular data program. And it's not that we are giving you one of these views of the program. You, all of these views of the program are available for you at the same time when you are compiling through polymath. If, for example, you have a module in your, uh, you know, in your accelerator, which is de de designed for computing gradients, there you go, you can offload that component. If you have a component which is designed to perform a matrix vector multiplication, then you, you can go inside that uh, compute, uh, you know, gradient, and then you have two nodes that you can uh, map to those, uh, you know, operations. And now if you look at the map mall, now you even at the same time, simultaneously, you have access to even deeper granularity, which is the, you know, vector multiplication and the reduction operation. If you have a reduction tree and a matrix multiplication engine, then you can actually schedule these over there. And when you are scheduling them, you need the scalar operations, which are at the same time are available. And this is the beauty of the, you know, multi-granular 
data flow graph. I'm going to, you know, skip over some of the details of compilation because I want to talk to you guys a little bit uh, about other stuff as well. So we've done, we've conducted, uh, you know, a user study uh, in, in terms of comparing Python versus PMLang, the polymasses lang, uh, language. And as you can see, in terms of the lines of code, and we gave them some practices, and then we asked them to implement k-means and BCT. You see, like I'm actually intentionally trying to show you things that are not deep learning, right? And you still can express them in the same language as you are expressing your deep learning, uh, you know, uh, code. So we see a 2.5x reduction in terms of lines of code. Uh, you could argue that reduction in lines of code is not necessarily a representative of the complexity of programming. A better proxy uh, would be time of development, in how much it takes to implement these algorithms. And you can see that, uh, you know, on average, you're seeing 2x reduction compared to Python, which is a very high level language. And Python doesn't directly, you know, translate to accelerators, but we have the infrastructure that allows you to, you know, to express that, right? We have evaluated polymath uh, in four different domains from, uh, you know, robotics in terms of mobile robot, hexacopters, data analytics when you're using, uh, you know, the commander systems or k-mean clustering, which is usually is not a supervised learning algorithm. It's actually an unsupervised learning algorithm, you know, uh, compared to k-means or even, uh, you know, deep learning. And then you have fast Fourier DCT, and then you have uh, ResNet and VGG. And the good thing about our deep learning support is that we integrate Onyx. So you can translate anything from anywhere to Onyx. And, uh, you know, we have a one-to-one -one translation because TVM can be a backend to our infrastructure, right? TVM is one of the, you know, stacks that supports, uh, you know, one sliver of the, you know, the whole uh, uh, cross-domain acceleration. And we have a one-to-one -one translation to their, uh, you know, IR, which is a relay IR. It's a very beautiful IR, actually, uh, you know, re a relay IR as well. So you get all of these in one unified environment. Uh, so in general, we provide, uh, you know, significant speed up, after enabling, uh, you know, acceleration for each of these things. Uh, I'm not gonna emphasize on any of these speed ups because I'm not advocating for any acceleration. I'm not giving you a hardware. I'm just giving you a compiled infrastructure that you would use different, uh, you know, accelerators. And these accelerators, some of them are ours. Some of them are not even ours, right? And then I'm automating this process that you can, uh, you guys can use like, you know, uh, these acceleration infrastructure so uh, because of the automation we have some overhead and that's around like you know uh, you know we still achieve 80 percent of the optimal you know uh, performance that you would get with hand optimized implementation but imagine you're getting so much uh, you know reduction in terms of the development and you're bringing so many things i think it's a it's a fair bargain one thing that i wanted to actually you know point out is that in the current form that we are operating, usually we only accelerate one domain, which means that, okay, I'm gonna take the DNN stuff and the, you know, accelerate it. Now, if I have a, an application like, uh, you know, these two applications, these are two different applications. One is the, you know, Black Scholes application for financial, uh, you know, prediction. The other one is a neuroscience application that involves, uh, you know, sending pulses into, into memory to enhance memory. I have an NIH grant that we are working with, uh, you know, colleagues in Emory University on developing brain implantable devices. And that requires FFD logistic regression and model predictive control, which are like, you know, different things. And what, you, what is happening is that if I focus on one of these things and accelerate it, which is the common practice, these days I'm gonna, you know, leave a significant amount of, uh, you know, performance benefit on the table because I'm not, uh, you know, uh, actually accelerating everything that I need to accelerate. My screen has frozen. I don't know if I, uh, do, okay, right. The same goes, uh, you know, in terms of energy reduction. So you can actually achieve much higher energy reduction if you are going after this. I'm just going to skip over the, you know, the rest of the results. Like, you know, we're happy to share the, you know, entire code base with you guys. And we're happy to, you know, open sources to, and we're looking for collaborators in that domain to help us to expand the, the, the work that we are doing. So I just inserted these slides into my, uh, you know, my, my talk. Actually, we heard the 
acceptance uh, uh, you know news two days ago for this paper and I'm extremely excited about this and you know the lead author Surush is one of my best students uh, in the group he's a very talented uh, uh, young student who started as an analog designer and studied some like you know work on analog acceleration for deep neural network which was published uh, this year in DAC but he has a long a large swing towards the digital domain and for the first time we actually designed a an architecture that allows you to simultaneously uh, co-locate multiple DNNs uh, execution on the same substrate so, and it offers simultaneous multi-threading in a true form while running multiple, uh, you know, accelerators. And, you know, when we talk to our industry collaborators, the reason that multi-tenancy, although it's a, it's a, it can be called a tenant of plot scale, you know, acceleration has been ignored in terms of the, you know, accelerator, uh, you know, world like TPU or even brain wave, is the arms race for higher speed and efficiency. People, uh, you know, were trying to design the most efficient and fastest, uh, you know, hardware, and, but that is not the most cost effective, uh, you know, approach towards this, right? Especially now that, uh, you know, deep learning, you know, as a service has become the backbone of most of the applications that we are developing. It's true that we still have research and we are developing technology that uh, you know allows us to uh, you know to do some limited operations at the edge, but most of the services that you are using that relies on deep learning, like voice assistants or recommender system, are deep learning as a service, right? And this is expected to scale, right? Actually, the statistics shows that we are gonna be scaling more. And then what that means is that if we are not supporting a cost-effective way of, uh, you know, scaling our resources, it means that we have to be like, you know, buy too many, you know, uh, too much of a, a hardware resources in, in, in terms of the cost of operation and the cost of, uh, you know, the cost of actually development itself. And the data center cost is actually extremely, significant. Uh, so, uh, so in a, in a sense, continuously increasing the number of, uh, you know, accelerator nodes is not, uh, you know, scalable. So what we need to do is that what we did with the CPUs and GPUs, and then we started providing multi-tenant solutions, right? Uh, but as I said, this has this dimension has not been explored prior. Although there are two papers this year, one in HPCA and one in ISCA, that they, which was concurrent with us, I would uh, look at uh, uh, you know multi-tenancy. The HPCA one from Korea, actually from KAIST, is uh, looks at. Uh, you know, temporal multi-tenancy, which means that you're not running multiple accelerators at the same time, but you are swapping them off in and out. So we are looking at co-location, simultaneous co-location in, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a sense. I, I think I talked about this, um, you know. So what we are trying to, uh, you know, accomplish here is that if you are given a, an accelerator, which is for DNS, which is composed of some memory modules and compute units, right? We can dynamically at runtime fission it, not fuse it, fission it and, you know, completely uh, separate it into multiple full-fledged accelerators that can simultaneously run multiple, uh, you know, accelerators. So what happens is that, uh, you know, you can take one DNN and run it on the, you know, accelerator, and then that is the, you know, logical view that the DNN execution engine is gonna have from the architecture. Or if you want to dispatch two DNNs, what's gonna happen is that depending on the requirements of the DNN execution, uh, uh, you know, uh, substrate, right? In, in terms of like, you know, how much computation we need, also priority, and also the, uh, you know, uh, service level agreement slack that exists. What are we trying to do is that, like, you know, when requests come to a, uh, you know, a server node, and then you, you want to service them, it's not true that you have to service all the, uh, you know, all the um, DNN requests 
at the same time, there is a service level agreement stack that you can utilize to be able to uh, uh, you know, run some of these DNNs a little bit fa slower, some of these DNNs a little bit you know, faster so that everybody reaches this, uh, you know, at the same time or with a good vicinity, with good guarantees, it uh, satisfies the service level agreement. And then what we offer is that we take the physical construct, which it has compute and memory unit, and then we fission it into multiple full-fledged accelerators. And then we have very much flexibility in the design that we have, uh, you know, provided. And Planaria is actually a useful name that one of my students, Bjorn Kuhn, actually came up with. It's, a, it's, a, it's an insect that if you cut it in, in the middle, it becomes two different, uh, you know, uh, individuals. Actually, they are fully functional, which is uh, pretty, uh, you know, amazing. And then even if you have three DNNs, you can still perform this. We can actually support up to 16 uh, DNNs co-located. Co so let me, uh, you know, let me dive into a little bit of the, uh, you know, the architecture itself that, 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 that was the kind of the high level view of this. So what we really wanted to do in terms of the microarchitecture for fission and providing that capability, and even the fission is some of those things that has not been supported in the, you know, in the past, in, in, you know, in general. What we wanted to do is that given the requirements of the DNNs that we are dispatching to the accelerator, we can uh, actually, uh, you know, balance the compute and memory uh, you know, allocations that we are, uh, you know, allocating to each DNN and adjust it based on the requirements. The, the second one is that we wanted to be flexible. It was not like, you know, let's just have the, the you know, architecture. As, as I showed you, those actually, those cuts that are like, you know, pretty irregular are a possibility in our design. And then we provide a compute aware task scheduling. Now it's a little bit different than the task schedulings that you would see in, uh, you know, even in CPUs and GPUs because there you don't have this degree of, uh, you know, amorphous compute fa yeah, fabric that you may, you know, giving it shape while you are actually scheduling the DNNs, uh, you know, over that. So we start with a systolic based, uh, you know, architecture. And if you pay attention to this blue, uh, you know, uh, blue uh, box that I have. If you look at a conventional, uh, you know, microarchitecture for a systolic area design, you have a kind of a waterfall-like flow of data. The, you know, the uh, activations are coming from the right side, then you have the weights, like if you're doing weight stationary, you, you have the weights in the, uh, you know, in the weight buffers inside the PEs, and then you have the, you know, the intermediate results and the outputs trickling down like waves. This is called, like, you know, wave fronts in systolic designs coming down to get added and, you know, uh, post-processed, uh, you know, in a semi vector unit, uh, you know, at the end. It, this doesn't give us enough, you know, flexibility. And why do I need to, ha ha to always adhere to this, you know, flow of data, especially if I want to be able to take some of these smaller systolic areas and construct bigger systolic area or cut them off like, you know, with, uh, you know, different ways. So the first thing that we have done, uh, look at some of the cuts that we want to provide. We want to be able to provide, you know, to be able to take the, you know, the systolic area, fission it into two horizontal rows or two vertical rows or even four quad, you know, quadrants, right? So, and then they have to work together in a, in a, in a certain way. So, and even, in certain, uh, you know, scenarios, you want, you might want to take these components. This is easy, and then chain them like beads to give you a thin and tall, or wide and fat, you know, systolic. Area. And this is not a possibility with the flow of data that is currently supported in, uh, you know, systolic arrays. So, uh, and then we need to be able to c communicate the data in different ways into the, uh, you know, into the systolic area. So what, what the first innovation that we have done is that, uh, you know, let me so, show you guys, is that we have added a few multiplexers on each, uh, you know, PE. These are very small additions to each PE, but then it allows an omnidirectional flow of data. You're not bound to go the farther fall now. You can go upwards, you can go this way, you can go that way. And that allows you to 
form these kind of you know weird connectivity that you want to uh, you know offer for different kinds of neural networks this is actually very 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 useful when it comes to something like uh, you know mobile net or any of these modern new uh, you know uh, neural networks that we don't we didn't claim any you know contribution in that front but like you know this actually allows to right to uh, the to implement point wise uh, you know convolution much much more uh, you know effectively and increase the utilization of this historic array for those uh, you know operations uh, you know in much much better uh, form so this simple addition to this historic array makes this historic array omnidirectional and now i can build very uh, you know very flexible uh, you know combination of these historic arrays to uh, to work with uh, with each other we call it bidirectional just uh, you know to emphasize that we are now supporting up and you know and the other directions that is necessary. All right. The next part of it is that, okay, systolic A, we supported fission. And the good thing about the systolic A now, because the systolic operation happens in wave front, you can actually segregate these physically on the chip as well and provide long wires between them, but they, those long wires can be pipeline. And it's okay to be pipeline because you are like, you know, pumping waves of data from like, you know, any direction now in our systolic areas. And they can go through the, you know, through all of the, uh, the you know, whatever the configuration that you are, uh, you know, uh, you are providing in terms of the efficient capabilities. But that is not enough, right? You still need to provide some on-chip connectivity. And since it's not a static, architecture that you have one array of computation and now like you know the data is coming from one side and the you know and it's being collected in the uh, another side we have to change the memory arrangement in such a way that we don't exert too much inner connect overhead because if you are uh, gonna take each of the memory components that you have provided for each of these sub arrays that you are fissioning right then you're gonna have high radix uh, you know, you're going to need to have high radix uh, 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 crossbar, uh, you know, interconnection between these things. And that's just, you know, completely in, uh, you know, in, infeasible. So what we do is that we take four of these sub arrays that we have and they can, you know, work together or can, like, you know, separate from each other and then add, form them as a, you know, as a fission part which is a one unit of, uh, you know, one unit of operation, although you can take a fission pod and it's still, you know, fission it more than just the granularity. So this is not the granularity of, uh, you know, fission. The granularity of the fission is the sub arrays. But then what happens is that it allows you to allocate the memory in the middle of four different sub arrays. And by just providing a, a, you know, a crossbar operation between the memory and these four, and you don't have to provide the crossbar from every connection, uh, you know, to that, you, you provide a low overhead connectivity between the memory and the, you know, and the, and the compute resources. And also this, you know, this connectivity allows you to configure the, you know, the memory with respect to the fashion efficient, you know, configurations that you are going to, uh, you know, support in your design. And so, and then you take all of these fission pods and put them together, you provide some connectivity, and then you can actually, this architecture that you're looking at, you can actually fission it into 65 different, uh, you know, configurations, and you can allocate 16 different, uh, you know, uh, DNNs at the same time on the, you know, architecture by like, you know, the dividing the fission pods into multiple, you know, organizations, and you can take one sub array from one fission pod and you can connect it to another sub array into, you know, fission pod and, you know, uh, uh, take whatever uh, is necessary for the DNNs, right? Uh, in, uh, in, the, in terms of the, uh, you know, task allocation, uh, here is that when a task arrives, uh, I have to emphasize that, that this is all happening at runtime. It's all happening dynamically. 
there is nothing that is static here, right? So everything is being decided at the node when the traffic is coming into, uh, you know, uh, into the node of the data center. So what it does, as soon as a neural, neural network, you know, comes, it gets to a task queue, and then based on we start, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> we start looking at how much, what is the minimal amount of resources that we can allocate into the, you know, for this uh, neural network, and then we give it a task score based on the, its remaining time and pri uh, priority. And, you know, and then if necessary, we readjust the resources for the other neural networks that are running. All of these decisions happen at the tile granularity. So while I have to finish one tile, and then if there is a new event, a new, you know, inference request that is coming, then I can decide and readjust all of these, uh, you know, operations. If not, when I'm doing from going from one tile and I need to readjust, usually the amount of reconfiguration bits that you really need to, uh, uh, you know, send to any of these fission parts is around, uh, you know, 12 bits for each fission part. So it's a very low overhead, uh, you know, reconfiguration. If there is no need to reconfiguration, you just continue the, you know, the operations as you go, uh, you know, forward. So we have looked at, you know, different mixtures of, uh, uh, you know, neural networks based on, uh, you know, whatever is available in ML curve. And then uh, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, uh, different scenarios with different combinations. So one of the, you know, advantages of our design is, uh, you know, one of the advantages of our design is that it actually supports, uh, you know, point-wise convolution much, much better than the, you know, regular systolic area because it gets, you know, extremely underutilized. So we kind of separated the, the, the you know, these kind of uh, neural networks uh, so we, you present the results in t three scenarios. One, you don't have any of these. The other one, you have mostly of these. And the third one is a mixture. And then when we talk to Google, they tell us like, you know, we always run a mixture of them. In the mixture, and especially when the, you know, quality of service requirements are rather, uh, you know, tight, uh, harsh, you know, we provide 12.2x throughput improvement over PREMA, which is a, a uh, very recent work from uh, Minister Roos, uh, uh, you know, uh, lab in KAIST, very inspiring work, which is just performing temporal uh, call equation, which means that you don't run multiple, uh, you know, DNNs at the same time, but you are swapping and uh, swapping out. I, uh, lots of kudos to uh, that team for developing, uh, you know, that technology. Generally, we are providing uh, much significant, uh, you know, throughput uh, in terms of we are also much higher in terms of, uh, you know, self satisfaction rate to, you know, uh, to PREMA. We can actually, we can reach 100% or close to 100%, uh, you know, satisfaction rate by just scaling up the design. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I can pr uh, provide that uh, result. In terms of fairness, we are providing like 2x, more than 2x, you know, uh, fairness. In terms of energy reduction, it's between 3.4 and 5.3. This is the part of the presentation that I don't necessarily like. You know, usually you, what you are presenting is that we have bars and our bars are better. So I'm just telling you guys that like, you know, what uh, we have provided with this, uh, you know, spatial co-location <coughs> actually gives us a humongous advantage with, uh, you know, uh, uh, over the, uh, you know, the pr prior height, which is actually very recent as well. So in terms of, you know, g getting to a hundred percent SLA satisfaction, the number of resources that you have to increase is pretty modest uh, to get to that point, which is not achievable with other, uh, uh, you know, uh, other techniques. I'm going to skip over some of the results because I want to get to some compilation. work. So I talked about cross-domain, I talked about multi-tenancy, you know, in terms of DNN acceleration, but one of the emerging, uh, actually, compilation, uh, emerging challenges when it comes to AI itself is, uh, you know, how to compile AI uh, and deep learning algorithms into existing hardware. And as you, you know, Louise, my former co-advisor, has a, a, you know, startup now, like, you know, which is working on that on that front, which is kudos to them for like, you know, recognizing this, uh, you know, need in the industry. It's actually pretty, you know, significant that, <coughs> uh, you know, the compilation for, uh, you know, AI 
has become such a uh, you know, hot topic. And I work with multiple industries and they are very interested in that technology as well. So uh, the, the reason being is that when we started actually looking at deep learning, right? And when I was looking at the early papers on acceleration, everybody would take like, you know, AlexNet and compile them and say that, oh, we are, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're such a good, like, you know, a uh, person in, uh, you know, hardware to run ImageNet challenge. But the whole point is that like deep neural networks and even the, the neural networks that are concentrated on the ImageNet, right? What has happened is that they're evolving so fast. Like the neural networks that you were using yesterday is completely deprecated, uh, you know, in the, in the coming years. So there is a need, a significant need for compilation. Actually, I didn't initially, I have worked on deep neural networks and not deep neural networks. I have my undergrad thesis was hardware implementation of conic section function neural networks that I, I'm sure most of you guys haven't heard of even conic section function neural networks in a, uh, you know, in a, in a general sense. So I've been working on hardware for neural networks for, um, I think, since 2001. So it's been around 19 years that I have been working on that topic. And uh, uh, so I didn't recognize the compilation, uh, the, 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 the importance of the compilation, but that's a very important, uh, you know. And you can see the variety of the neural networks that we are looking at. Actually, the neural networks are no longer, are, <coughs> are no longer as, <coughs> as uh, regular as they used to be. Like Alex Nessie has a very regular structure and now we're facing randomly wired neural network, which is an emerging uh, you know, type of neural networks that are coming from network architecture search for more efficient implementation of the neural networks. So how do we do the compilation? Like at least this is what TBM does, right? And we love TBM. So, and then what happens is that you have a DNN model, it's expressed as a you know, a humongous number of, uh, you know, uh, nested loops. But these nested loops, right, especially when it comes to the, uh, you know, the execution, managing the cache and the memory, which is actually completely obfuscated from, you know, the rest of the, you know, system. And here, I'm actually not talking about accelerators. I'm talking about CPUs and GPUs, right? TVM's target is to enable microcontrollers and even achieve higher, performance on conventional hardware without checking hardware can I extract more performance out of it right so what they do is that they create kernel templates which is a very uh, you know parameterized uh, nested loops and then the optimizing compiler that you know VMTVM has developed is you know uh, actually you know finds the right values for these uh, you know loops and also the nesting order for some of them Right, so that is the decision making that you are performing. Right, since you are targeting an existing hardware, which is not a an accelerator that you have like a god mood uh, control over the hardware, then you have to perform. You, you're doing this optimization and decision making in a very blind fashion. Right, so you don't know what like if you use thirty two or sixteen, is this a good choice until you actually run the code on the hardware and see how much like, you know, uh, flops per second or whatever the measure of the performance you are getting. And what that means is that your, con you know, compilation pro process and optimization process involves generating a large number of possible binaries and running them on the hardware to measure their fitness or measure their optimality in terms of, uh, you know, the work. Actually, TVM has done uh, you know, a significant amount of uh, work to reduce the number of measurements and runs that you have to do on the, on the hardware. But if you actually look at ResNet 18, first of all, there are two things. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the, on the x-axis, you see the layers of the ResNet 18. And then <coughs> on the y-axis, you see optimization time, which is hours, right? So you're looking at hours. But in these hours, you can see that, uh, you know, around, you know, 80% of the time, even more than 80% of the time, goes to physical measurements and the search algorithm, which is trying to find the best, uh, you know, <coughs> best combination for the, you know, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the template code is just, uh, 
10%, 20% down. So it's very important to focus the, you know, our, uh, you know, our search algorithm to into the reduction of like, you know, we all know about Amdahl's law that 80% is up. Right? So we took a, you know, a, and a holistic approach here, right? So we wanted to improve the efficiency of the search algorithm itself because TBM mostly relies on randomized search algorithms like genetic algorithms or like simulated anything. It seems like it's the best uh, that they have come up with. And then how to reduce the costly hardware measurement. These are the two challenges that we are going after, right? Our solution is that we started with adaptive code comp compilation, which means that we you know, adopted a reinforcement learning approach towards compilation because reinforcement learning allows you to, uh, you know, explore the space much, much more efficiently. And I'll explain, uh, you know, um, um, I'll explain how it actually does that. And then we also innovated in terms of the measurements on the hardware, which is, you know, how do we actually do the you know, increase the sample efficiency. Sample efficiency is a terminology in machine learning that refers to, you know, how much information you can extract from a sample that is measured, right? If you have a point of data, how much you can extract from that, right? So in terms of, uh, you know, the, I have to show you one thing, and this is a one <coughs> aspect of the search space. This is the visualization of the search space. There are two points that I have to you know, point out in terms of the search space. The first, the search space is not differentiable. You can literally see how it gets cut up in certain, uh, you know, certain points. It's like you're, you're searching a f uh, source of food in a classroom with desks. There are ups and down very step functions there. So you can't differentiate the search space. So you can't use the gradient, uh, you know, <coughs> gradient approaches. Like, you know, gradient approaches are like smelling food, right? If you have, if you can hear the smell of the food, right? You can actually very fastly, you know, convert to the point that the food is. But if you're searching for food, but if the food doesn't have a smell, you have to just literally go search everywhere, right? And, <coughs> and having gradient, is like having this one. Here we're looking at, uh, you know, at a very honest mood on, uh, you know, on a structured, uh, you know, uh, non-continuous space, is a search space. <coughs> Second thing is that you see there are lots of similarities in certain, you know, search spaces. You still see that geospatial, you know, similarity that exists. And that's one of the things that we actually explore. The way that we are using, uh, you know, uh, 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 RL here is quite interesting. It's that what we do is that we actually, uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, we actually, what we do is that we launch a 128 walkers in the space that are just walking the space through reinforcement learning algorithm. How are they doing it? They reading the, the, you know, whatever the state of the, you know, compilation is and applying it to the policy network and policy network actually gives you an action. And the actions that it gives you doesn't say, okay, now jump from this space to the other space. That means that, okay, you know, completely change the, you know, parameters of the template code that you're compiling. It's actually a very gradual step. It takes, like, okay, increase the unrolling factor by one <coughs> or increase the tile size by one, right? Which allows you to gradually walk through the, you know, the space. We're, and we allow each of these walkers to walk for, uh, you know, for 512 steps. If we were to evaluate in each step, if the space that we have visited is, uh, you know, is a good, uh, you know, good um, candidate for the compilation or not, it means that I have to compile it and measure the, you know, the, the, the flux. That's quite infeasible that like, you know, each search step would take, you know, humongous number, uh, number of, uh, humongous amount of time. So what we do is that instead, uh, we, <coughs> uh, what we do is that uh, we actually, we just remember where we have visited, right? And then now we have a collection of samples that we have extracted from, by just walking around the, you know, the search space of the, you know, Thailand. And now 
if we were to, as I said, like, you know, we, we've collected 64,000, like, you know, samples, and that would take 18 hours to measure. So that's not going to work out. So my brilliant student, what, what, uh, what he did, said that, okay, if I look at the space of the samples that I have <coughs> collected, I'm sorry, my, my allergies are like, you know, I don't have Corona. I'm so hoping that even if I had, I wouldn't be able to transmit it to you guys through internet ways. But like, you know, it's just uh, my, my throat gets dry. So, so these, not all of these samples are unique. And what I can do is that I can just cluster them and measure the centroids of those clusters instead of measuring all the samples that I have collected. So, and that is our adaptive sampling, as you can see, uh, this is, uh, you know, what happens is that I wanna know if I'm in a good region or in, I'm in, in a relatively bad region. So by just doing these, uh, you know, smart sampling through clustering, we can actually, uh, you know, find the, you, you perform very few measurements on the, you know, on the hardware and still be able to guide our reinforcement learning algorithms like, you know, uh, <coughs> walks through the, you know, the space. And one of the biggest problems when it comes to clustering is that how many clusters are you going to have? One, two, four, eight, 16. The way that my student has actually, Bjorn Hoon has done a very smart trick here. Uh, and since we want to do, you know, we don't want to have any manual uh, you know, intervention here. Uh, uh, so what he does is that first it performs, uh, you know, two, uh, two, class, uh, two cluster clustering. Then, it, uh, you know, he performs, uh, you know, four cluster uh, clustering and then checks the distance bit from the centeroids and the nodes that are assigned to the centeroids. If you go from two to four and the distances haven't changed that much, that means that, oh, two was good enough. But if you go from two clusters to four clusters and the distances have changed significantly, it means that, oh, four is necessary. And then you can go to eight. And then, you know, when the, you know, distances diminish, then you have found the number of clusters that you have to do. You're not still doing any measurements. You're just finding the number of set rules that you are uh, going to perform the measurements. And then what happens is that, uh, so with this, uh, you know, with this, this work compared to Auto TVM Chameleon, which is our adaptive, you know, infra, you know, infrastructure, not only reduces the exploration time because we are using a more effective search algorithm. Reinforcement learning remembers the steps that you have taken and considers them while taking other steps, right? While random search algorithms, <coughs> they don't necessarily do. And by using adaptive sampling, we reduce the hardware, you know, measurements. There are certain things that we actually combine some of the solutions that we find, uh, you know, synthetically also to uh, generate better samples when we are performing uh, <coughs> these things. In terms of the evaluation, we looked at AlexNet, VGC16 and ResNet18, and, uh, you know, this is our target head for NVIDIA Titan XP. If you look at it, right, we have been able to uh, reduce the, the compilation time by 40. And if the compilation time was just two minutes and we had like, you know, reduced it by 4x, it wouldn't that important, but we have cut it down from, you know, tens of hours to, you know, less than two hours or around two hours. So what that means is that there is much, much more room for performing, <coughs> for, for doing, uh, you know, better, uh, you know, uh, op uh, compiler optimizations. I have to point that out that, uh, you know, while we are reducing the compilation time, we can actually find better solutions. The better solutions are like, you know, uh, slightly better. The reason being is that uh, my screen is frozen. Sometimes my laptop, uh, you know, freezes. The reason being is that, so generating random search algorithms actually top the, uh, you, you know, the quality and then you get better results, but we get around 6%, you know, improvement in terms of the, you know, execution time. That is significant because we are at the, the, at the end of the spectrum for, you know, performance, uh, you know, improvement. And as you can see, we are getting, we are taking fewer steps than, uh, you know, uh, than uh, search steps than, the, the, you know, our adaptive exploration or reinforcement learning approach. Uh, and then we're performing much sig significantly lower number of measurements on the hardware. The, 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 the reduction in the search steps, it doesn't manifest itself as much in terms of the runtime. <coughs> 
but in terms of the number of hardware measurements, it actually, you know, compilation time is actually, you know, quite a bit reduced, and that's because of the Amdahl law that we saw, but they work together, in a, in a sense, to provide a better solution. So I don't know how much time I have. I'm probably out of time. Uh, if you guys want to, I'm going to skip over some uh, our analysis paper. I'll give you guys a, a you know, very short introduction to, uh, you know, two of our quantization works that Ahmed has, uh, you know, developed. Uh, and I'm actually, because uh, Sanin told me that you guys have looked at DCQ, which is uh, accepted to, uh, you know, ICML 20. I'm going to talk about VQ. This is actually, on, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, under review for NIPS. This is a mistake here. And <clears throat> I'm quite very excited about this approach. And this is, uh, you know, this wasn't my idea. This was Ahmed's idea. And so, uh, you know, uh, the credit goes to, uh, you know, Ahmed. What we wanted to perform here is that, so there are lots of algorithms that given a, uh, you know, a number of bit assignments to, <coughs> to, <coughs> to the layers, then they perform quantization and they, they can improve the, you know, the quality of the, uh, you know, uh, the prediction. What this work does is actually is a gradient-based mechanism that not only gives you better quantized weights, also simultaneously finds the number of bits that you're going to use for the quantization of the layers. So you don't have to give it the number of the, the bits. It's actually mathematically finds the number of bits. And the brilliance of the idea is that Ahmed has introduced a regularization term that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, inspired by weight decay. But what it does, it's actually a sinusoidal regularization term. And he adjusts the, uh, the minimas of the sinusoidal regularization term on the quantization levels or the quantization values that the weights needs to, to go. So, and then since stochastic gradient descent is naturally pushing the, the weight values into the minimas of the loss function, which now this has shaped the minima of the loss function in the way that the, the, the minimas are adjusted on the, you know, on the quantization level uh, given a bit width, <coughs> then, <coughs> then you naturally, while you're training the neural network, you get actually, uh, you know, uh, quantized weights. But the brilliance of this is that the period of the sinusoidal wave is designed in such a way that it's correspondent to the number of bits that is appropriate for the quantization levels that you're going to use. So you can think about this as like, a, you know, one of these like instruments that you can open and close. So while you are doing the stochastic gradient descent, the sinusoidal wave is expanding or contracting based on the number of bits that are appropriate for the quantization of the neural network, while the minimas are sticking to the quantization level. So that is the high level idea. This is the regularization term that you are seeing. These beta i values are actually, uh, you know, determine the number of bits. And you're actually learning these beta i values. And they just, if you just take a ceiling of them, then that represents the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the waves, uh, the, sorry, the quantization levels and the, you know, bit widths. So we, uh, you know, in one training path, true gradient uh, you know based approach which is very significant because we don't have to do any kind of like you know randomized circuit. we have some work which is coming out in you know, IEEE micro as well which uses uh, you know reinforcement learning algorithms to find the bit bits it's one of the most uh, you know difficult parts of the this it actually you know learns these uh, you know at the same time I'm sorry I'm skipping over uh, some of the <coughs> the results but here you are looking at the results here, right? So in terms of the number of bits. So as you can see, AlexNet or ResNet 18, <coughs> the numbers that you see on top of the bars is the number of bits that the algorithm itself has, you know, figured out. And you can see that we actually achieve very close to full precision accuracy while finding the bit that says, and uh, you know, everything. I think I talked too much. I'm sorry if, uh, uh, you know, it was too much. Uh, and thank you please very much. Please take your for... time. Please take your time. We are uh, uh, very I... uh, excited about this uh, works. Uh, if you want me, I can tell you guys a little bit about the DCQ as well, and then uh, you know, uh, I'll wrap it up. I'll give you guys the you know the um, 
you know, some of the actually wave Q is not published yet. So I'm just giving you guys some things that are <coughs> completely, <coughs> you know, um, hot out of the, you know, oven. This is the work that is just going to be presented in ICML this year, but this is divide and conquer. This is again, Ahmed and Pranoy's idea. That wasn't my idea. They actually came up with that idea. <coughs> it's quite interesting. <coughs> so uh, it, this actually kind of goes back to the <coughs> uh, neural networks. <coughs> uh, you know, uh, qu quite natural operation. What is happening in a neural network is that you take an input, and here we're looking at images, but this technique is actually not restricted to the images. Actually, we, we have applied uh, some of these techniques to transformers as well, you know, for language transformation as well. Uh, what you're doing is that you are extracting features in the layers of the neural network. And <coughs> Each of these features have a lot of relevant information about the, the layer. So the deep learn, uh, the, the, and then there is a technology which was developed by Jeff Dean and uh, Jeff Hinton that you, that's called knowledge distillation. And the, the, the objective was that if I have a big neural network, how can I train a smaller neural network which does the same thing? So what they do is that they, uh, you know, throw out the last layer and then they, <coughs> they apply random inputs and they get the random outputs from the pre-trained large teacher network. And then they use those random input output pairs to train a student, which is a smaller neural network. This is the basics of knowledge, uh, you know, distillation. And knowledge distillation in its original form actually has been used for quantization. You can imagine that you take a teacher and you replicate that as a student, but in quantized domain, and then you use these, uh, this approach to train the quantized uh, neural network. What these guys have done, instead of doing an end-to-end, -end, they've said, okay, this whole thing is ignoring all the important in information that is preserved in the intermediate representation of the neural network. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna take the neural network, we're gonna partitioning it into sub uh, you know, sub layers. So if you have this neural network, you're going to section it into section one, section two, until whatever the number of sections, you're going to split it. And then you're going to take one of the subsections, let's say subnet one, and you're going to, uh, uh, <coughs> that, <coughs> that is, uh, that section is quantized and it's trainable. So you're adjusting the, the weights in, and you're trying to perform quantization on it. So you can use any quantization training algorithm. This is an approach on top of uh, quantization algorithm. And then, uh, you know, you train that just only that subsection as a teacher apparent test method. So you're looking at a subsection and you're, you know, uh, you're performing quantized training. Then you go to the next subsection. So what you do is that you still go back to the full precision mode for the previous section, and you're just performing the quantized mode, uh, you know, for that subject. It's very counterintuitive because you're quantizing only subsections while keeping the rest of the neural network in, uh, you know, full precision. And you're gonna repeat the same thing until you have quantized train, uh, you know, each of these subsections, and you're gonna stitch them together. And it actually works beautifully. Right, and uh, I don't have the mathematics chops to, uh, you know, prove that this is, uh, you know, this will not reach to a error propagation problem and it's not gonna diminish the, your error. Me, we, you know, we have a collaborator who has actually proven that mathematically and this will still preserve the accuracy and you're not gonna have the error propagation problem. And one of the things, one of the good things about it, this is actually an acceleration mechanism because you are training each of the subsections of the neural network in isolation. So what you need to do, you can literally parallelize this quantized training without having any centralized control. Each of these subsection network quantized training networks can be as assigned to a node and they can be, you know, uh, you know happen in the, you know, in parallel. Not only you are performing quantized training to reduce the inference, uh, you know, uh, complexity of the, you know, the work, but also you can parallelize this, you know, quantized training process, which is actually pretty beautiful. And, uh, you know, all the credit goes to, you know, Ahmed. We have significant, you know, improvements. I don't want to get into, uh, you know, any of these things uh, in terms of, uh, you know, benefits. 
and I I can talk about analog, but I'm not sure that is like you know appropriate uh, you know at the moment. I think it's better to stop. Uh, you know, here you guys have are aware of with Fusion, but we have a new design which actually performs analog computation. I just presented it in, uh, you know, Google, and this this, this is based on switch cap, uh, you know, design and provides significant improvement over, uh, uh, you know, with Fusion as well as, and this is actually the very first vector analog, uh, you know, um, the, uh, architecture that is performs, uh, you know, analog computation in a vector mode. Uh, you know, uh, in general. Uh, so I'm going to skip over uh, this. Uh, yeah. These are some of the works that we have done. Just want to get to my last slide. And um, I usually finish my talks uh, if I can actually find my. I actually finish my talks with uh, this uh, Persian. Uh, Miniature by Maestro Mahmoud Fashian, which depicts the fifth day of creation. If you uh, think of biblical stories, they, uh, you know, they say that like God created uh, the heavens and earth in six days. We are still in the fifth day of uh, you know creation. There is so much we need to uh, we need to do, and there is no end to human uh, ingenuity, uh, and there is much more that we can uh, perform. And we are at the beginning of the road for cracking artificial intelligence. And I think one of the things that people have to pay attention is artificial consciousness. Whatever we're developing is not conscious. None of the deep neural networks can think of themselves. But that's not how, uh, you know, the natural behavior of the systems that we see, uh, you know, manifest itself. I'm sorry I was over time. I, and, uh, I was too fast in parts and I skipped over some slides, so I apologize for that. I'm happy to uh, take no problem. I think you provide the insight. Very much impressed by the the wide spectrum of your work, and especially many of which provide or pioneer a new angle. Um, so now we open up for questions. I actually got a question from both uh, the Q and A and also private chat. Uh, Hadi, how much more time you can uh, stay? I'm gonna. Pick the questions. Or, mm. I have another meeting at three thirty. Uh, okay, okay. I think we we uh, wrap up uh, within uh, ten minutes. So the, one of the question is for chameleon. Things each. Uh, so I'm gonna read the question. So chame for your work, uh, chameleon. Uh, things each configuration uh, needs one policy network to sample. Uh, does all policy networks share the same weights or no? Yes, yes. This is one, you know, one, uh, you know, one neural network as a policy network. But we launch it in parallel to explore the area. Come back. We don't do measurements. Uh, you know, they explore independently. So you're using one neural network to explore the area. You're just collecting the sample. The samples come back. You perform the clustering. You select the centroids. You do the measurements and then you update, right? So you don't need to, because if we wanted to, <clears throat> uh, you know, kind of perform this, like, in a, like you know, we're gonna like have 16, like, you know, I don't know, 120 uh, different policy network, that would be impractical. So it's still one neural network, you launch it to go, you know, explore, give you the samples, cluster, measure, uh, measure update. That is how, like, you know, how it works. Thank you. Uh, so why I'm reading the question in the message, for those of you who haven't got chance to uh, type your message, you can also raise your hand so I can unmute you to speak your questions. So, uh, so the next one is about the first work, I think Marty Granular DFG. So the question is, uh, you talk about mm, the generalization then uh, the graph is general, but then how can we predict the performance? So when you do the automatic uh, schedule. Okay, <clears throat> so are you talking about the multi-granular, uh, you know? So there are two, two the, first of all, when it comes to the compilation, we actually don't do the performance prediction at the moment. We're just providing the facility or the tools so that you can compile multiple domains in the accelerators that you can have like you know in your uh, you know in your on, on, uh, on your design 
since the multi-granular data flow graph has, you know, gives you the finest granularity of the operation, usually if you have access to that data flow graph, it's very easy to predict the performance of any accelerator. So as soon as you have the data flow graph that is going to be mapped to the accelerator, <coughs> it's easy to perform the, you know, <coughs> the performance prediction. The whole point here is that we don't know which subset of the application is going to actually be mapped onto the accelerator while we are compiling. So we preserve everything and you still have that, you know, have the access to the finest granularity. So when you decide that, okay, I'm going to map this to such and such accelerator, you get access to the finest granularity data flow graph. Let's call it the flattened data flow graph. And then from that, I'm sure any accelerator that you build has a you know, prediction mechanism that says, okay, if given this data flow graph, I can compile it, and this is the number of like, you know, cycles that it's gonna you know, produce. Usually that's what happens when the accelerator is. Okay, that makes sense. So, so for the next one, it's about uh, pl uh, planaria. So uh, maybe uh, the audience say, maybe he missed the, the, the detail. So from the high level view, what's the difference of this work? Uh, compare with just naively put several representative accelerator together, like um, Iris and Bifusion others. So what's the high level difference? Of right, so the high level difference is that this is a one accelerator. You can think about that I have taken Google's TPU and I, have, I give it the possibility to dynamically at runtime to partition to multiple accelerators that are smaller than the Google TPU. You can still use it as a big Google TPU for running one deep neural network at, you know, at any given time. But if you were to run two, three, or 16 neural networks at the same time on the, you know, on the same hardware without changing the, you know, the, you know, manually changing this, you can take this and it can dynamically efficient. And what happens is that what is important here is that this fissioning is not just like, you know, let's divide it by 16. It is actually aware of the requirements of the neural network, the traffic that the neural net, uh, you know, the node that the accelerator is sitting there is, uh, you know, uh, you know, <coughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, needs to be done in terms of the quality of service, remaining time, and all of these things. So none of the accelerators that are, exist right now, I can very confidently, you know, claim that, offers the possibility that to take one substrate, physical substrate, and <clears throat> in 65 different ways, partition it and map multiple neural networks at the same time on the same substrate. You can allocate multiple accelerators, like you take one iris, one TPU, and put it on a humongous chip, but still you will not be able to partition any of the designs, like the TPU or the iris, into multiple, you know, accelerators that can run multiple uh, neural networks at the, you know, the, the same time. That is the new capability that comes to, to play, and that what, what gives you is that now, if you have a humongous number of, uh, you know, inference requests that are coming to your servers, right, they get distributed across the node. And <clears throat> given the stack, the quantity of requirement, you can use fewer number of accelerators and still achieve the, you know, the, the same number, of, you know, the, the cellular satisfaction rate that is, uh, you know, required for your, uh, as a service provider. Okay. I think this is a very unique angle. I also also have some question, but let me keep hold back my question and let the audience have chance to speak up. Chao Jian, you are the next. So we, we only have two questions so that uh, Professor Azamea today can uh, be on time on his next uh, meeting. Okay. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Chao Jian Li, and uh, I have a question about the DCQ work, uh, because I noticed uh, when we don't quantize the activations, I think it's very straightforward to understand that once the quantized part have the same activation with the full precision ones, we could have the same performance with the full precision networks as the remaining part are the same. Yes, right. But if we quantize the activations, 
I think it's difficult to make the quantized activation the same with the full precision ones. So in that way, uh, I'm not very clear about uh, how to make sure they have the similar performance uh, when the activation cannot be the same. Okay, that's a very, that's an excellent question. <coughs> so, first of all, like, you know, you have seen the workshop paper, which doesn't perform the, you know, the activation quantization. The ICML paper actually performs the activation quantization as well. So we have that data. The second part of it is that when we, when, when it comes to my work in terms of the quantization, I'm not doing 8-bit quantization. I'm actually going below 8 bits. Like, you know, what we are trying to achieve even if you don't consider, you know, activation quantization. And in the, you know, when we say like, you know, we're not doing activation quantization in the workshop paper, they're running at eight bits, right? It's mm -hmm. like equivalent to full precision. I, I agree with that. <laughs> so uh, what is happening is that you're actually pushing the weights to the least number of bits while maintaining the, you know, the accuracy. And if you look at most of the, you know, the papers that have been written in this area, right? <coughs> so parts of the work is actually, uh, you know, focuses on the weight quantization because in conventional hardware, if you don't consider bit fusion or stripes or any of these bit flexible architectures that are out there, which have not been fabricated in reality, you actually mostly want to quantize the weights to reduce your memory requirements, right? <coughs> and so there is a benefit when it comes to quantization. If you go, be, you know, whatever you do, even just do weights, right, in terms of the memory storage, uh, you know, requirement, you, you are absolutely right that, like, you know, if you do activation quantization, then you have much more, uh, you know, reduction in terms of the <coughs> performance. <coughs> but that is, you know, hard to exploit in conventional hardware, although in our ICML paper we have, uh, you know, uh, activation quantization and the proofs of, uh, you know, convergence are also there uh, regarding that. Thank you very much for that question. I hope that I answered that. Okay. Yeah, and, and we have many more questions for those of you that I cannot read your question. Sorry, I think if you reach offline for sure, uh, Professor Asmaeus there would be happy to. We still have quite some questions, but um, maybe one last quick question uh, for Yonggang. Oh, you, I think maybe Hadi, uh, do you still have time for one more question? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah it's okay. okay. And uh, if you have more questions, the best way to, uh, you know, address those questions, send an email to the first author of the paper and CC me. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. I'm <laughs> extremely behind myself on email. So, and Celine kind of like, you know, experienced that I'm very slow in responding email. It's not that, you know, I don't want to respond to the email. Not really. Like I'm very yeah. simple, you know, on their, you know, email. So if you have questions that I, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to, and I'm sorry that I had to, you know, jump to the next meeting, just send an email to uh, the first author of the paper and CC me. I'll make sure that uh, you guys get all the answers and we're happy to answer any questions. We want to engage with you guys as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Hadi, for your time and for your wonderful talk. Uh, I think um, well, let's uh, stop here because there are many questions uh, I can't read. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much all for attending. I think you excite them. Yeah, it will be okay. nice uh, to follow up later for our collaboration and also for some, some advice. Yeah. Of course, I'm happy to like, you know, follow up, just like, you know, contact me and I'll, like, you know, I'll send you my, uh, you know, I think the best way to reach me sometimes, like if necessary, like, you know, my phone. So I'll send you my phone number as well, like, you know, to have it just in case. But I, you know, I eventually, I have an eventual consistency model when it comes to email. I eventually answer the email, but in terms of the timing, I'm not like, you know, <coughs> I'm not uh, uh, that responsive on the email my, myself, but my students are all, uh, you know, happy to engage with you guys. We're pretty excited about the works that we are doing. And, you know, some of these things, as you I see, I'm not just trying to, you know, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, blow my own horn. These are new frontiers in certain, you know, aspects of the, the work that we are doing. And we're happy to collaborate and we have happy to, you know, work together. I'm actually expanding my collaboration platform <coughs> as much as possible. Great, great. Uh, then uh, let's finish on time for those of you that your question 
or I cannot have you speak up. I think um, Professor Asamayo said already promised if you email the first author and CC him, you will uh, for sure get the answer. And thank you very much, Jihadi, for your time. Thank you very A very much. wonderful thank and inspiring much. work. Thank, thank you, you all much. for attending. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. I really enjoyed the talk and I hope like, you know, we can answer any questions and we work together like, you know, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Look thank forward you to that. Yeah. Me too.